any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder to everyone, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Uh, should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I'll request that the member please mute their microphone. A reminder as well to insert a document into the record. Please have your staff email it to documents, T and I, at mail.house.gov. Now start with uh, my opening statement. Good morning and welcome to today's witnesses uh, and everyone joining the Aviation Subcommittee's hearing titled Bridging the Gap, Improving Diversity and Inclusion in the U.S. Aviation Workforce. The topic of this hearing comes at a critical time for the U.S. aviation and aerospace industries. Over the last 18 months, these industries were hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. 557 million fewer passengers flew on U.S. airlines in 2020 than in the previous year, as a for instance. The growth of aviation manufacturing was also hindered by the pandemic. By the end of 2020, the value of aircraft deliveries declined by nearly 15%. So as the nation reopens and Americans return to air travel, a discussion must be had regarding the status and needs of the aviation and aerospace workforce. And I acknowledge that I have myself more work to do to understand and address these barriers, such as systemic racism, to enable inequity and injustice, that, that enable inequity and injustice to persist in the United States. As subcommittee chair and as a member of Congress, I've made highlighting the importance of an increasingly diverse uh, country and what that means for the U.S. aviation and aerospace workforce. And developing an increasingly diverse workforce is a priority. It's important that the economic and job opportunities available in these industries be available and accessible to all Americans. However, in many cases, the U.S. transportation workforce does not reflect the diversity of the country. Unfortunately, the aerospace and aviation sectors are, not, are, are no exception. A recent survey of the industry found that women comprise 25% of the industry's workforce, while only 6% of respondents identified as a person of color and just less than 18% identified as Hispanic or Latino, according to an Aviation Week 2020 workforce study. The aviation and aerospace sectors also expect a good chunk of their workforce to retire soon. The Aviation Technician Education Council estimates that 30%, 30% of the current workforce is at or near retirement age. So to meet the increasing demand for new and skilled aviation workers, employers must expand the talent pool from which they've traditionally drawn. To fill existing and future workforce needs, several challenges must be met head on, and today's witnesses will help this sub subcommittee to better understand the need for diversity in the U.S. aviation and aerospace workforce and challenges faced in their journeys to succeed in this industry. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Rebecca K. Luti, Assistant Professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha's Aviation Institute, to share her research findings on representation in aviation and, and challenges to improve diversity in the sector. One such challenge is the basic lack of exposure to aviation and aerospace careers for young people, especially from minority communities and women. The federal government and industry must make a concerted effort to help promote these careers among these communities to better diverse, diversify the workforce. I'm pleased to as well welcome Captain Claudia Zapata Cardone, Executive Director of Community Relations and Outreach for the Latino Pilots Association. Captain um, Zapata Cardone, I look forward to hearing your story and your recommendations to enhance the talent pipeline. We're also joined by Mr. Joel Webley, Board Chair of the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, or OBAP, an organization at the forefront of creating more pathways to, to these careers for historically underrepresented groups. Mr. Webley, I'm interested in learning more about your expertise in aviation and OBAP's various outreach programs. In their efforts to grow the aviation workforce, employers are also faced with the skills gap. Employers have found there's a lack of skilled workers in positions requiring more than a high school diploma, but less than a four-year college degree. According to a 2018 industry report, the skills gap may leave an estimated 2.4 million manufacturing positions unfilled between now and 2028, resulting in a $2.5 trillion loss in the economy. One way to address the gap is to help active duty service members and veterans to transition into well-paying careers in the aviation sector. Congress and this committee 
owe it to veterans to help them find pathways to the skills necessary for employment in aviation and aerospace. And I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Kyle Kaiser, president of Viper Transitions, about his organization's critical work to help veterans enter this workforce and what Congress can do to support these efforts. Underrepresented communities also face the challenge of bias when attempting to enter aviation careers. A 2020 study conducted by Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University found, quote, consumers and other pilots favored white males in all conditions, while females and minorities were viewed less favorably. That's unfortunate. The same study found such biases could deprive the aviation industry of the best job candidates. Efforts undertaken by the industry itself are critical to overcoming the challenges underrepresented groups face entering these jobs, which is why I'm pleased to welcome Ms. Isima Gibbs, Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for JetBlue Airways. So Ms. Gibbs, I look forward to hearing more about JetBlue's efforts to recruit a more diverse uh, talent, and particularly in frontline operations and in leadership roles. The FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 included several provisions to improve the recruitment of young people and women to careers in the aviation industry. The Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force is responsible for providing recommendations and strategies to the FAA to encourage high school students to enroll in courses and secure apprenticeships that, that prepare them for an aviation career. And last year, the DOT announced 20 appointees to this task force representing a diverse range of backgrounds and expertise in aviation and education. The Women in Aviation Advisory Board is also tasked with exploring opportunities for education, training, mentorship, outreach, and recruitment of women in the aviation industry. The DOT announced the appointment of 30 members to this advisory board in May of last year. The law also established the Aviation Workforce Development Grants to fund scholarships, apprenticeships, and other outreach initiatives to expand educational opportunities for the next generation of aviation maintenance technicians, aircraft pilots, aerospace engineers, and operators of unmanned aircraft systems. So a question I have for today's witnesses generally is, are these initiatives enough? Does Congress need to do more? As a nation works towards full economic recovery, the federal government and industry must and can work together to break down barriers and ensure careers in the aviation and aerospace industries are available and accessible to all Americans. Doing so will not only boost continued economic growth, but, to, uh, but help to ensure the long-term health of the industries themselves. So I want to thank today's witnesses for uh, coming, and I look forward to the discussion. With that, I want to recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Graves of Louisiana, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing today and thank all the witnesses for, for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you can look at the statistics and it's crystal clear that, that we can make significant improvements in, in diversity. Uh, I believe the, the number of pilots that are, that are women uh, in the United States uh, it comprises about 7% 7, 7 and for flight engineers, it's even lower than that at 4.3%. We can make improvements in uh, diversifying, the, uh, including better inclusion of in communities of color in uh, flight mechanics and uh, in, in our pilots and engineers and others. There's, there's no doubt. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think taking a step back, which is what we ought to be doing right now, uh, we're, we're seeing huge shortages in workforce across the United States. The aviation industry is certainly uh, no exception to that. We have stepped in and done programs like the payroll support program trying to ensure that when we saw these extraordinary uh, drops in, in passengers, as I recall, 95% uh, reduction in commercial uh, passenger travel in April of last year, uh, obviously it's impossible to maintain a workforce with those sorts of numbers. Um, but now, uh, I know when I flew in yesterday, National Airport alone was, was, uh, was probably the busiest I've seen it uh, since the pandemic. But, We've got to work to, to, to help to make sure that, that all industries have workforce. And recently in Atlanta Airport, I was there, where only two of the businesses on the entire concourse were actually open because of workforce shortages. And I, and I think that some of the statistics are clear that looking at the states that have stepped in early and cut off the supplemental um, unemployment assistance, those states have seen an increase in employment. And, and I think that we certainly need to work across all industries, but um, focusing on the aviation industry, uh, there's no doubt with the, with the surge back in travel uh, that there have been some extraordinary challenges in meeting the demands. 
Um, uh, in the aviation industry, there were shortages even before COVID, and we knew that there were increased retirements, that you saw that there were not as many folks coming into the workforce, and you're seeing an exploding industry, whether it's the aerospace. I know the chairman was telling me uh, before the hearing that he was thinking about uh, spending some of his excess $28 million on a trip to space, um, and we're seeing an explosion there in, in that industry as well as uh, as, as uh, unmanned systems, drones, and other um, uh, other technologies that, that are causing a surge in demand for aviation, for aerospace um, uh, workforce. In, in the 2018 authorization bill, as the chairman noted, we did create grant programs. We created a task force uh, trying to improve employment, improve diversity in the task force as well. And I'm very proud in the, my home state and my, my, um, uh, in our district in Louisiana, right on the campus of the Baton Rouge Airport, uh, they're opening up the uh, Helix Aviation Academy, which is gonna start its first sixth grade class this year, and then go on to seventh and eighth grade as well, trying to play our role at home in, uh, in, in, in trying to meet the future demands of, uh, of the workforce. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think it's important that, that as we work forward that we're informing people about the opportunities that are there. There have been studies showing uh, that there were misconceptions in, in, the, um, in the future of, of, of uh, the occupation, of the career, the, the opportunities that are there. And I think that we've got to do a better job helping to inform the public and through some of the programs we created through the 2018 bill, uh, the workforce training bills to ensure that, that, that the, the public understands, that students understand about the huge opportunities uh, that are there. It's important because the United States, um, we expect to, to remain the global leaders in, in aerospace and in aviation. And if we have workforce shortages, we're not gonna be able to maintain that edge and, and have the professionals and uh, the expertise that we've had in the past. Uh, we also need to develop um, new workforce, uh, a workforce for new and emerging careers, including drone pilots, cybersecurity professionals, and commercial space uh, transportation engineers. We need to partner with labor industry and academia to address these issues, which will be critical to ensuring that we maintain our leadership. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today, and before we, we break, I, I do want to ask unanimous consent um, that the uh, statement by Mark Baker uh, from the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association be included in the record. Sorted. Yield back. No. Uh, I would note for the record uh, the, the ranking member's comments about my desire to fly um, were apocryphal at best, and folks can look up the word apocryphal for the definition. Uh, with that, I will um, now recognize the chair of the full committee, uh, Representative DeFazio of Oregon. You're recognized. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, for holding this committee, uh, this hearing. I, I think it's perhaps the first time the committee has addressed this issue uh, through a full hearing. Uh, just like last year, for the first time, we heard from uh, the exploited and underpaid uh, service workers uh, at the airports. I mean, these are things that need to be exposed, and they need to be resolved, and they can be resolved. Uh, you mentioned a number of the provisions in the uh, 18 FAA authorization, uh, which, which should help. Uh, we're seeing some progress uh, on the industry side, more by uh, some uh, airlines uh, than others, uh, but we want to uh, certainly uh, encourage that. I mean, the numbers are miserable. Uh, you know, over 50% of the population's female, 2.4% of pilots are women. Uh, no, 7% are women, 2.4% uh, as mechanics. 13% uh, uh, black, 3.4% commercial pilots, 18% uh, Latino Hispanic, 5% uh, uh, Asian 6 to 2. Uh, you know, we, we need uh, to meaningfully uh, deal with these issues, and as was noted by both speakers, we need more talented people in this industry. We need them both, uh, you know, uh, on board uh, as pilots, uh, but we also need uh, people on the ground uh, as, as uh, mechanics, great paying jobs, uh, which don't require as significant of an investment uh, in education as becoming uh, a pilot. Uh, you know, we've noted before that there is a substantial barrier uh, to uh, becoming uh, a pilot, and that is the extraordinary cost of the education and the training uh, that's necessary. Uh, you know, there's some who say, well, maybe we should roll back uh, the 1,500-hour uh, rule 
uh, to uh, lessen the cost. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe uh, that that is uh, prudent, and I wouldn't support that. You know, I fought for many years, starting in the 90s, uh, on, uh, on the um, hours uh, of training uh, for commercial pilots and noted for many years it took many more hours to become a hairdresser in Oregon, 600, as opposed to, I think it was 250 or 350 for a second seat on the plane. Uh, and we saw the horrible results uh, in Colgan Air, and, and we finally uh, got, uh, got those changes uh, done. But, you know, finding ways uh, to reduce these barriers, uh, you know, to uh, induce young people, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, for mechanics, uh, a lot of young people are not aware that, uh, you know, about what a great trade it would be uh, and how they will be earning way more, uh, uh, you know, shortly after uh, they finish uh, their apprenticeships uh, than uh, their their friends who go on to four-year college in in many uh, with many with many degrees. So there are there are great opportunities out there. I won't repeat the things in the 18 bill that the chairman talked about. I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses on their ideas for solutions today. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, now we'll um, go to the witnesses on today's panel. Um, I'll just introduce each one. As they um, as they testify, uh, first will be Dr. Rebecca Luti, Associate Professor, University of Nebraska at Omaha Aviation Institute. You are recognized uh, for five minutes, and without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Dr. Luti, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to address the subcommittee to discuss developing a diverse aviation workforce. I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Aviation Institute and serve on the FAA's Women in Aviation Advisory Board. I'm here speaking for myself as an aviation professional with research experience in aviation workforce and diversity. My primary area of research is women in aviation. It is essential for the future of the aviation industry that we have broad representation within our workforce. A diverse representation of thought results in enhanced safety, innovation, and profitability. In addition, to meet the workforce needs of the future, we simply must target a wider talent pool. The goal is to recruit and retain the highest level of talent for the future of the industry. Many groups remain significantly underrepresented in aviation. Overall, women make up less than 20% of the aviation workforce in most occupations. The largest gender gaps continue to be in the areas of senior leadership positions, professional pilots, and maintenance technicians. Only approximately 5% of airline pilots are women. Women in maintenance represent one of the greatest gender gaps in the industry at 2.5%. Further, the workforce in many aviation occupations lacks ethnic and racial diversity. For example, BLS data indicates the pilot population is 94% white, 3.4% black or African American, 5% Hispanic or Latino, and 2.2% Asian. It's especially important to note that many of these numbers have changed very little over many years. And this brings me to my first recommendation. We must have better data on the numbers of women in underrepresented groups within aviation. What gets measured gets done. Establishing a comprehensive system of tracking data and reporting on trends is the only way to verify that diversity investments and efforts are working. As a minimum, the FAA should expand the data published for airman certification to include race and ethnicity. To increase the number of women in aviation, we need to address the barriers. Research has shown that barriers include a need for increased emphasis on youth outreach, lack of women in leadership positions, the high cost of entry, particularly for flight training, difficulties in balancing the demands of family and work, and negative culture to include gender bias and sexual harassment. Recommendations to address these barriers include formal mentorship and sponsorship programs, increased access to financial aid for students, and family-friendly policies such as paid family leave. The last barrier to discuss is perhaps the hardest to tackle. The evidence is clear that culture is a deterrent that hinders the ability to recruit, advance, and retain women in aviation. 
Changing culture requires a change to the overall system. That includes looking at artifacts of culture like language, uniform, and representation in images. And in addition to change the environment, underrepresented groups must be part of decision making and considered for leadership position. And lastly, there needs to be more effective education and awareness of the existence of bias and harassment and methods to address it. I've talked about the significant gap of underrepresented groups in aviation, some of the barriers and some recommendations, but let me end on an encouraging note. In my over 30 years in aviation, I've never seen so much momentum behind efforts to broaden representation in our industry. We've seen strong initiatives from industry like the United Aviate Academy. We have best practices for aviation outreach to underrepresented groups, such as Women in Aviation, Girls in Aviation Day, and the many youth programs at the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. And perhaps one of the best indicators is the FAA Women in Aviation Advisory Board. The final report of this board is targeted for release in the first quarter of 2022. It represents many hours of work by industry leaders to identify bold recommendations to meet the goal of creating broader representation for the future success of aviation. I encourage you to carefully review that report when completed. I'll leave you with the following thought. Every system is perfectly designed to give us the results that we get. If we want increased representation in our aviation workforce, it's time to change the system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Luti. Now recognize um, Captain Claudia um, Zapata Cardone, the Executive Director of Community Relations and Outreach Latino Pilots Association. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. It is an honor to appear before you today. My name is Claudia Zapata Cardon, and I'm a proud Latina pilot, a daughter of Colombian immigrants, and a union member. I am proud to fly for United Airlines as a captain on the Airbus 320. As someone who had a dream, I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss with you today the importance of breaking down barriers and creating opportunities for all those who dream of flying, because that's what we need to do if we want to guarantee a strong, robust, and highly trained pilot workforce, while also maintaining the safest air transportation system in the world. When I was growing up, my father worked at the airport, and we would bring him dinner almost every night. I remember thinking how magical it must be to fly an airplane. My parents face a lot of hardships along the way, each parent often working two jobs in order to support our family but they were determined to chase their American dream. Looking at those airplanes every night, I didn't think that being a pilot was an option because I had never seen a pilot that looked like me. But the older I got, the more determined I was. And because of the work ethic instilled in me by my parents, I rolled up my sleeves and began the process that ultimately led me here today. I feel like I've achieved something beyond what my parents could have ever imagined, which is why I'm committed to creating a more diverse and inclusive aviation workforce while also ensuring that the United States continues to remain the global leader in aviation safety. Currently, I serve as Executive Director for Community Relations with the Latino Pilots Association. In addition, I'm a proud dues-paying member of the Airline Pilots Association, the world's largest pilot union. Together, our outreach efforts are connecting with Latinx students from around the country to educate and demonstrate the amazing benefits of being an airline pilot. It's important that more people who look like me are able to access this profession and that we tap into the currently underrepresented pool of potential airline pilots to ensure a healthy and robust <clears throat> pipeline in the future. LPA and ALPA are committed to changing what the pilot community looks like while maintaining current safety standards. There are several steps policymakers can take to ensure we have an adequate supply of pilots, break down barriers, and help foster a more diverse and inclusive aviation workforce that reflects the communities and customers our industry serves. Chair Larson, thank you for your leadership in sponsoring the Bipartisan Promoting Service and Transportation Act to help attract the next generation of transportation professionals while creating a more diverse workforce. And the subcommittee's inclusion of the Women in Aviation provision as part of the FAA reauthorization in 2018 is producing meaningful benefits to expand opportunities for women in our field. Other ways Congress can help this mission is to align federal funding support for the education required to become an airline pilot with that of other highly skilled professions. 
authorizing and increasing federal educational aid programs, such as the Pell Grant Program, would help provide financial assistance to students following two and four year degree programs at post-secondary higher education institutions in order to cover the cost of aviation training. Additionally, we should expand opportunities for those who fought for our country to use their GI Bill to help cover the cost of two and four year flight training degree programs. Congress could consider student loan cancellation programs that would allow airline pilots to work for a specific period in exchange for loan forgiveness. And finally, we should review government guidelines to increase the number and amounts of subsidized loans available to students for flight training and ensure students who receive unsubsidized loans do not accrue interest on the loans while in school. Currently, there are severe economic disincentives for pilots considering employment at regional airlines, which serve as a main avenue for individuals to enter the profession. It's important that we improve this entry point to the piloting career while maintaining the first officer qualification requirements that have helped make US air transportation the, the safest mode of transportation in the world. I believe we can and must do more as a nation to open the doors of opportunity for those currently underrepresented in the piloting profession and maintain the highest safety standards in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I wanna to turn to Ms. Isima Gibbs, the Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at JetBlue. Ms. Gibbs, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Subcommittee on Aviation. My name is Isima Gibbs, and I'm the Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for JetBlue. I'm excited to speak to you today about JetBlue's efforts to improve diversity and our recent changes in our recruiting programs. How, and, and really I wanna talk about how the aviation community can come together to become more inclusive and more equitable. As a founding member of JetBlue, I have been with the airlines since the very beginning, before we even had planes. This is very personal to me. For almost 22 years, I can honestly say I have often been the only person of color in the room and quite often the only woman at the table. With your help, we have an opportunity to diversify the aviation workforce to better reflect the US population, our customer base, and the communities we serve. Two parallel paths will help us in this industry. One, increasing representation, and two, building awareness for aviation careers as early as possible. One direct way we are able to affect our hiring pipeline is making sure that we are inclusive in that process. Over the past year, as we paused hiring during the pandemic, our talent and acquisition team used their time to produce a new interviewing method. It's called Blue Select. As we reimagined our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, we realized we had been using the same interviewing methods for decades. While continuing to focus on our culture, we completely rebuilt the process to reduce unconscious bias and increase diversity in the process. We're addressing inequities and helping to correct the biases that where they exist. We are tackling diversity recruiting in three specific areas, focusing on frontline careers, such as pilots and technicians, creating upward mobility in our support centers and developing a more diverse state slate for our officers and directors. Our goal is to create equity for all and reflect the diverse communities and cultures we serve in all aspects of our airline. We're prioritizing an, invest an investment in our crew members who, already, who are already passionate about our business and have a stake in our culture and our success. While we are a diverse organization overall, frontline crew members specifically, that dwindles as we progress to each level. Our greatest opportunity for improvement is within the officer and director ranks where racial and ethnic composition have remained stagnant. Internally, we have developed new pathways to help more frontline crew members transition from the operation to support center roles. These prescribed pathways will enable a more diverse slate of candidates to be in the talent pool who ideally will grow into leadership roles. We're creating an inclusive environment where all crew members can envision themselves in leadership roles because they actually see people who look like them already in these positions. 
and we're holding ourselves accountable. We're trying to double the race and ethnic minority representation of officers and directors from 12.5% today to 25% and increase representation of women in officer and director level from 32% to 40%. And we're trying to do this all by 2025. Our gateway suite of programs launched in 2008 helped to ensure pilots find their path at JetBlue and now includes an additional path for internal crew members interested in transitioning to careers as technicians. With our internal programs, we are hoping to alleviate two common barriers, financing and the risk of leaving a permanent job while training full time. We provide a conditional job offer based on the successful completion of these programs. Our goal is for costs not to be an obstacle for those who are selected into these programs. Moreover, our Tech Ops Apprentice Program is an opportunity for well-paying jobs for those who have already completed their training and exams to earn an airframe and power plant certificate. It's a 12-month training program where apprentices can gain on-hand experience and mentoring while working in the operation. Upon successful completion, apprentices are offered um, positions as technicians. We also work with Aviation High School, which is right in our backyard, right down the street here in Queens. And that school has prepared high school students for becoming aircraft mechanics. The caveat is Aviation High School is only one of five high schools in the nation that offer these types of programs. So in closing, JetBlue's diversity, equity, and inclusion centers around growth and more inclusive work and creating a more inclusive workspace that drives better decision-making and innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gibbs. Um, now I'll turn to Mr. Joel Webley, the Chairman, Board of Directors of the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. Mr. Webley, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Joel Webley. I'm Chairman of the Board of Directors for the uh, Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. I'm honored to appear before you today on behalf <clears throat> of the more than 2,600 professional members that we represent. As an organization steeped in 45 years of advocacy and service, OBAP is proud to stand on a foundation that focuses on career and creating career opportunities in aerospace and aviation for underrepresented communities. At the core of all we do lies the mission to introduce, educate, and empower Black Americans and other underrepresented communities to create pathways to success through youth programs, young professional mentorship, and career development. Each year, we reach tens of thousands of youth program participants and thousands of aerospace professionals, removing barriers to entry and providing access to information that will begin the shift to change the tide of diversity in our industry. We believe with the support of partners at all levels, we will influence change. Today, the aviation industry is grappling with how best to improve inclusion and diversity. According to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, 93% of pilots are white males. Uh, and further, less than 5% of CEOs and less than 13% of top executives are women within global airline industry. This year, inclusion is top of mind for many CEOs, with a reported 77% having a diversity and inclusion strategy or intending to put one in place. The aviation industry strives to address skills gap and over and the overall population becomes uh, more diverse. Cultivating diversity in a culture of inclusion is likely to remain a key tenant for successful organizations in the coming years. Benefits of diversity. Although practicing inclusion and bolstering diversity are good ethical practices, the aviation industry also stands to benefit from boosting its diversity in the following areas. New ideas and perspectives. Talent gaps, new ideas and different perspectives are more likely to be well-rounded or more likely to build a more well-rounded and diverse workforce. A 2016 Harvard Business Review article states that diverse teams focus on facts, process facts more clearly and are more innovative. A more diverse team can lead to a strong defense against groupthink and stale ideas. Improving the bottom line, According to the Center for Talent and Innovation, the companies that can reap a diversity dividend unlocked by better understanding underserved demographics and new areas for service altogether. 
Further, McKinsey and company found in 2019 that companies in the top quartile for diversity outperformed those companies in the fourth quartile by, 34, by 36% in terms of profitability. How to increase diversity. Aviation organizations and government can establish many different practices to grow diversity, including measurement. As Dr. Ludwig pointed out, many businesses and agencies have made commitments to improve diversity, but there's a large gap in the available data to give decision makers a clear picture of where they currently are, as well as updated information on how to understand the effectiveness of diversity initiatives. As an industry, it's critical that we measure what matters and have a common data set from which to compare progress and make adjustments. More granular data from organizations such as the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, and other non-government entities would be extremely helpful. Other initiatives such as uh, promoting the uh, attachment of performance incentives to diversity goals and metrics throughout the industry, uh, introduction of increased mentoring programs, partnering with schools. Uh, for example, minorities are often underrepresented in STEM subjects when obtaining their education. By working with schools to bring more female, black, and other minority speakers to campuses, the industry can inspire more underrepresented groups to pursue an, an education that equips them for the field and ultimately to join the field. Partnering with special organizations such as OBAP. Organizations can also provide mentorship and training to groups that are underrepresented in aviation, encouraging the next generation to join the industry. Similarly, organizations such as the Sisters of the Sky, Professional Asian Pilots Association, the Latino Pilots Association, National Gay Pilots Association, and others provide scholarships, mentorships, uh, opportunities, uh, professional conferences, and networking opportunities to help their members. OBAP truly excels in creating programming that provides tangible value to youth, considering aviation careers and to early career professionals looking to take the next step. It's our sincere hope that the aim of this committee is to create more resource opportunities so that we can create, our, we can continue our important work into the future with government and other partners. Thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Webley. I appreciate your testimony. I'll turn to Mr. Kyle Kaiser, president of Viper Transitions. Mr. Kaiser, you're recognized for five minutes. Chair Larson, Ranking Member Graves of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to give testimony here today. Unlike a lot of the colleagues that uh, I have now been able to associate with, I do not herald from aviation. Um, I am an electrician by trade. I'm a veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan, airborne infantry, sniper, Transitioning out of the military was not easy. Uh, finding your next career path is not easy. Uh, aviation was not ever on my radar. I was an infantryman. What I knew about planes is that I could jump out of them and get where I needed to go quickly. So what brought me here to where we're at now? Well, I've already given you a little bit of background about who I am and what I've done. An important thing to remember is we all have something that grounds us, something that keeps us connected. The reason we started the organization Viper, Viper Transitions, is to end veteran suicide. We believe we can do this by eliminating some of the lead causes, unemployment, underemployment, substance abuse, homelessness, and honestly, repairing a fractured support system. The support system I had during the military and after uh, can be pointed to one person, uh, my amazing wife, Kathleen. Without her help and, and her backing, I don't know where I'd be. It's quite possible, and I could be one of the statistics of the 22 a day that we lose uh, to suicide. When you start looking at, at statistics, and I really wasn't sure where to go with my testimony uh, on whether or not I should bring a bunch of statistics and data. Um, so I chose to go a little bit different route. I prefer to be more uh, somewhat informal and direct. Veterans have a hard time getting employment when you get out of the military. When you start talking inclusion and demographics, the military covers everybody in our country. I served with people from all uh, ethnicities, you know, religious beliefs, backgrounds from all across the nation and other countries that use the military to become citizens of, of the United States. We need to do more when it comes to transitioning service members into good paying jobs. Uh, Ranking Member Graves mentioned industry, academia, and labor. I'm proud to say that 
Viper has a support in aviation from all three of those groups, uh, namely AAR, uh, AMFA, and, and AIM, have all come to back Viper in our program. Uh, in August, we're going to be launching our first cohort to address uh, aviation maintenance. We designed a program that's 12 weeks long. We'll put uh, veterans and military spouses into the program. They'll get their training that they need to step into a current aviation, whether they choose to fulfill uh, the requirements of the FAA through Part 147 schooling afterwards, or go straight to work for an employer, they're on a route and a pathway set up to succeed. Uh, and I can't speak enough on what that does for the mental health of our veterans. I understand this is not a mental health um, subcommittee, but it does all tie together. When you're in the military, everybody knows who you are by what's on your chest and on your sleeve. They know if you've been deployed, they know if you've seen combat. They know what schools you've gone to. When you get out, you're just a name and a number. Thank you for your service doesn't pay the bills. And far too often, veterans are told, thank you for your service. The application line is there. We'll get to you if we get to you. And then when you do get to the interview, you get one of two normal comments. Either you're overqualified, which as an infantryman, I've very rarely got, or you're underqualified. Sorry, we need somebody with more experience. I would recommend that we encourage industry partners to expand apprenticeship opportunities. Apprenticeship opportunities recognized by the Department of Labor provide a great resource for veterans and everybody who served our country. You can use your GI Bill to offset the cost of starting out at a lower wage, and that provides a huge boost to a family's income uh, to be able to afford to start a new career over from the beginning. I never looked at aviation because those opportunities didn't exist. One of the most common phrases I get from veterans that are already out when they hear about the work we're doing is, wow, I wish they had that when I got out. And that's the truth of the matter is that the transition and the system we have set up to bring people into careers, leaving the military needs work. The aviation industry has the opportunity to not only create programs, to boost the numbers of veterans choosing to get into aerospace, but to back groups that do that. You mentioned Every Riddle, they have a fantastic skill bridge program. Viper Transitions is also a skill bridge program that targets all veterans from every branch, every occupation, including their spouses. Thank you for your service is not enough. We need to do more. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. Um, now we're gonna go to uh, questions, uh, five minutes each from members. Uh, do something uh, unusual for the Chair, I'm going to uh, recognize uh, Representative Williams of Georgia for uh, five minutes. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is absolutely unusual. As a freshman member of this committee, I just knew that I was gonna be two hours into this hearing. So I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you, Ranking Member Graves, as well as Chair Lawson for holding this important hearing. And thank you to all of the witnesses for testifying before the subcommittee today. And I especially want to take a moment to welcome Captain Zabata Cordon, who is a constituent of my district down in Atlanta. My district is home to the nation's busiest airport, but right now the aviation industry does not look like my district. For instance, over half of my constituents are black, but black individuals comprise only 3.4% of all aircraft pilots and flight engineers. Y'all, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that our aviation workforce represents the diversity of the congressional districts and the nation that it serves. As a congresswoman from an incredibly diverse district, I know that diversity is what makes America strong. Diversifying our aviation workforce is the right thing to do, but it also presents an economic opportunity. As the aviation industry rebounds from the pandemic and works towards long-term recovery, the industry is going to need talent to fill its job openings. Diversifying its hiring pool will give the industry an opportunity to meet its workforce needs. Captain Zabata Cordon, it is important that members of traditionally marginalized communities have access to the aviation profession. Given that our country's pilots are 92% white and 91% male, and we have a lot of work to do to make sure the aviation workforce is re reflective of the diversity of our nation, in your testimony, you mentioned that there are currently economic disincentives for pilots considering employment at regional airlines. Can you please elaborate on what those are? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, 
going into the regional industry is a way to uh, build your experience. And traditionally, it has uh, been the lowest paying job. Uh, basically, when you were going in as a first officer at a regional airline, and I'm just going to use my example, when I was finally hired at a regional airline and back in 2010, my first full year, I made approximately $21,000 as a airline pilot. Um, that's a huge economic disincentive. While the pay has increased due to market demand, um, it's still not enough. Uh, pilots that are entering the regional um, industry, as Dr. Rebecca Ludi noted, um, it is very, uh, there's a huge barrier there, especially for women, if women want to start families for family leave. Uh, pay and qual life of quality issues are still an issue for the uh, regional industry. And that's something that needs to improve in order to bring more people into the piloting profession. Um, as I said, when my first year not making that much money, it was very difficult to not only, you know, pay rent um, and just live, but you also have to think about the financial barriers of the student loans that were taken out in order to continue in flight training um, and that that was a huge barrier. So those are things that need to be addressed and improved in order to have that robust pipeline. Thank you. And Dr. Lutt, it is apparent that there's a lack of women serving in leadership roles in the aviation industry. In your testimony, you mentioned that mentorship and sponsorship programs could support the advancement of women in aviation. Can you give us examples of what such a program would look like in the aviation sector? Thank you very much for that question. We, we do know that women in leadership position, really members of underrepresented groups for that matter, in leadership positions, um, need to be, um, we need greater numbers and, and uh, more representation there. So uh, mentorship and sponsorship programs, particularly formal mentorship and sponsorship programs within aviation organizations will allow us to identify top talent, um, make sure that that top talent is informed of the opportunities that are available to them, uh, make sure that we have professional development um, for members of underrepresented groups, and just ensure that um, they're getting that sponsorship from uh, those in leadership positions to make sure that they're getting the opportunity to make that leap and make that gap. Um, and we may, you know, certainly my colleague from JetBlue can probably speak more to, to what they have in place at their particular airline. But, um, but I think it's, it's important and valuable that we do have that in, a, in, again, a formal program to identify that top talent, make sure that they're getting the opportunities um, and trying to uh, getting that attempt to increase the numbers of underrepresented groups in those key decision-making roles. Thank you. And Ms. Gibbs, I'm unfortunately going to run out of time, so I'm going to ask that you submit your answer for the record. In your testimony, you identified an opportunity to increase diversity within the officer and director ranks where the racial composition has remained stagnant. And you mentioned that JetBlue has developed some new pathways to help crew members to grow in leadership ways. So if you could submit that to more details about that to those pathways for the record, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Williams. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Representative Graves of, of Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for the testimony. Mr. Kaiser, thank you for your service. And I, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, some of the training programs that you're implementing now. Um, I understand from your testimony you're starting an aviation maintenance program. Can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of the, the expectations from the various training programs for active duty service members and uh, veterans and their spouses, uh, kind of the, the results of the programs and what we can expect? All right, yes, sir. So what our program, uh, the Aviation Maintenance Program that we're getting ready to launch here in August is a little different from most transitions programs. In order for somebody to come through our program, they have to be guaranteed uh, placement, either in a 147 school or with an employer. Um, we don't like, guesswork when it comes to transition and what you're going to do with your next career. We think there should be a pathway set up to get that taken care of. Um, as far as the program is concerned, it's a 12 week program. It's going to cover general aviation. You'll leave. Um, you won't be an AMP. I'll go ahead and clear that up. It, 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 I liken it to a pre-apprenticeship. Uh, we're going to give you the skills you need to start your journey. Um, does that answer your question, sir? It does. It does. Thanks. So do, do you believe that this is something that can be replicated or, or for some reason you think it's unique to, to your area or the way that you're, you're administering the program? 
Uh, I believe our program is unique. However, it is definitely something that can and should be replicated, in my opinion, uh, across the board. Uh, I look at industry screaming for manpower and needs, and it's no secret aviation is not much different than the other industries I, I work with. Uh, as far as you know, retirement, people are leaving. Uh, they're not going to be around anymore. What are we going to do to fill that void? Um, and there's 200,000 service members getting out of the military annually. Can, can you speak to how you think that your effort, efforts or these efforts will contribute to diversity in the workforce? Yeah, so our, in, in the military, I served with every ethnicity I could think of and, and religious belief uh, without any issue. And, and when you're getting into the military, all of those people and all of those demographics are still there. Uh, the representative uh, congresswoman from Georgia, that, that near and dear to my heart, Fort Benning, uh, Infantry school, airborne school, sniper school all took place uh, in Georgia. Uh, what are the statistics of uh, uh, African Americans serving in the military in Georgia? Those are things that we can look at. And as programs are developed, they should keep in mind when you're looking at veterans in the different areas. You know, in Alaska, we work with a lot of groups for uh, Alaska Native veterans, uh, working to get the Alaska Native veterans who have served uh, into careers here and abroad. Um, so there's there's no shortage of any opportunity when looking at the military to to target and, and support diverse groups. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Ludi. Thank you for for your testimony. You 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 mentioned uh, that there has been a, a a challenge, I think, in absorbing or, or excuse me, I guess the transition of female aviation students into uh, the the private pilots, and and I I just wanted to make sure I followed. Uh, sort of what you were trying to convey to us, are these being absorbed by the commercial aviation space or what, what, what is the reason for that, uh, that lack of conversion? So it, it's an important, I think, data point to look at because our student pilot representation for women is a little over 13%. When you look at private pilots, it's about six. And the number of private pilots, women who are private pilots has only increased by less than half a percent over 15 years. So why is that important? It's important because it's a pipeline indication um, of, of coming into the profession. Um, and it's important in terms of how do we do a better job at converting that 13%. First of all, let's get that higher, but that 13% of student pilots into private pilots. And there's several barriers I think that we can look at uh, in that area, including cost, um, some factors uh, for the training environment, that sense of isolation, the need for community of support and some other areas. But that was that was a point of including that uh, particular uh, data point. Thank you, I appreciate the clarification. Uh, last question, Ms. Gibbs. Uh, uh, could you just shed a little bit of light on JetBlue's uh, new method of interviewing Blue Select? Sure, Blue Select is an um, initiative that we've put forth to ensure that we have an opportunity to reduce bias in the interview process. And oftentimes bias is not intentional, but it is pre prevalent. And so our Blue Select program is a way to, it's a competency-based interview selection process that allows us to really hone in on the skills that we're looking at and that allow for a lot of opportunity for you to insert your particular bias because everybody's seeking the same information from the candidates. And that's our um, Blue Select program. Great, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I'll first go with Dr. Ludi. Um, can you be uh, more specific about the use of data and what you think we can do to help develop data? You said number one thing we have to develop is data. So what, should, what data and how do we use it? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, you know, one of the key areas, again, is, you know, coming back to that what gets measured gets done. So we need a better baseline of information of where we're at in terms of women and underrepresented groups. Um, and so we do that through, it, it's a challenge to come up with the data points in this area. Um, so you have to go to a variety of sources. We need better information, for example, on race and ethnicity, including the F FAA Airman certification data. Um, we can get better indications from industry of rep, you know, what the representation is. There's a great example by Boeing, for example, who recently published their um, diversity data online. And that's helpful to get a better sense of industry. But in terms of government, again, um, FAA data, um, some good data sources from the DOT can be uh, potentially expanded. Um, but the other one I'm gonna call for, you know, shocking, I know as a university person it is funded research in this area. 
Um, and not just data on what the numbers are, but data and information about how well we're doing with our outreach and recruitment efforts. And looking not just at outputs, but outcomes, so that we know that the effort that we're taking, the money that we're spending is going to the right place. So better FAA data, better funding for evaluation efforts on outreach, uh, recruitment, retention. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gibbs, uh, JetBlue, the gateway programs, um, well, the gateway programs is one, but just the overall approach that you outlined in your testimony, um, how did that emerge at JetBlue? Why, why did you end up deciding at JetBlue to, that you needed to um, up, your, up your game on, on this kind of outreach? We, we've long since noticed that there was a need to diversify our pilot work group, and we were very aware of the cost um, obstacles for becoming a pilot. And so we started the Gateway Program in um, 2008 to help pilots find a way into the, um, uh, to find a pathway into JetBlue. Um, and we've worked with these pilots um, consistently to mentor them and ensure that they had all the support that they needed. Um, we've heard quite often that there is a, an isolation factor. And so we've provided support and mentorship for, for pilots through this program. We've expanded the gateway program for internal crew members and we're really happy to announce that we have 22 crew members who um, have recently gone through all of the rigor to become, to enter into the pilot program. Safety is our number one value and we are putting forth those 22 people in two separate classes and helping them, really mentoring them to become um, pilots. But these are JetBlue crew members. And so how better to show your commitment to our industry by taking people who are already here and already committed to um, the company and, and offering them an opportunity to become pilots. And so we have flight attendants and people from so many different backgrounds who will enter into this program and become pilots. And then the second program that we created most recently is to encourage um, crew members to become technicians. And so we're just starting to take applications and recommendations there. And we'll be launching that program and having those, those crew members be um, get on their way and their pathway um, for that program as well. So those are the two main gateway programs that we're doing for both pilots and technicians. And then we have a, a program to bring um, crew members from the operation into our support centers, our support centers or our corporate offices, and how do we um, help them become um, part of the pipeline to eventually and hopefully become leaders within the organization and all framed around um, bringing in diversity through all of those methods. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Webley, um, heard some about mentoring from uh, previous two witnesses. Uh, can, I don't know there's a formal role that Congress plays to expand mentoring, but do you have ideas about mentoring and, and expansion of mentoring programs? Yeah, I think um, uh, what Congress might be able to do is leverage some of the existing um, platforms and um, I guess structures. For example, uh, United States Air Force has a formal mentoring program that they use internally. Um, the FAA probably has their own uh, mentoring program internally that they use for uh, whether it be moving people into executive roles and things of that nature. And I think uh, maybe a model that could be followed is the same way the FAA has provided sort of best practices and a structure for what's called the Aviation Career Education Program, ACE, which is um, like summer uh, aviation camps for students. Um, the FAA could provide sort of a baseline package that any organization could pick up and get started with their own mentoring program, whether it be a nonprofit, whether it be a company, um, like I said, sort of establishing maybe a center of excellence to provide that, yeah. that, those, the baseline information. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, I now recognize uh, Representative Balderson from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for Mr. Kaiser, and Mr. Kaiser, thank you for being here today, and I'd also like to thank you for the work Viper does every day to help the veterans transition into meaningful careers, and this is something that's talked about everywhere I go in the congressional district, um, and even in my past years uh, in, in the state legislature. But I'm very concerned about a potential shortage of qualified maintenance technicians in aviation, I hear this a lot. With your organization's expertise and experience in workforce placement, how many veterans do you believe would be qualified to work 
in these roles in civilian aviation? That's my first question. And then does Viper Transitions believe transitioning veterans to these roles could make up a sizable portion uh, of this shortage? Uh, so the first question, uh, Mr. Congressman, is I couldn't tell you how many would actually qualify. Uh, that's part of the reason Viper Transitions got set up is to give people qualifications to have the job that they're going to be hired for. Uh, as far as impact on uh, people coming into the industry, I absolutely believe it will have a, a massive impact. Uh, like it, there's 200,000 veterans get out of the military every year, and 150,000 of them don't have a career lined up, uh, or even a job for that matter. So if you present this type of opportunity uh, to a veteran or a military spouse, uh, it's imperative that we don't forget the spouses when we're talking about the military and transitions um, because serving is not just on the service member, it drags your family along for the ride as well. Um, so I believe given the sheer number of people exiting the military every year, a, a more robust system for recruitment and training um, to bring into these careers it, it is absolutely going to have a, a substantial impact. Uh, like I said, our programs are designed for any military occupational specialty, any MOS. Um, we care about what you did in the military, but not as far as your next career is concerned. We want to, we want to set you up for success on a pathway that you want to get into. And so that's what our, our programs are designed to do. Okay. Well, if, if my office or myself can assist you um, with getting some data on that, we, we'd love to work with you on that. And look, as I said, we go around the district a lot, and, and it's something that's talked about every single day. Uh, when we go out. My follow-up question to you would be, uh, in your testimony, you note that many employers are struggling to find workers. We've talked about this. This is a concern I hear daily. Uh, can you discuss how Viper locates and identifies businesses who desperately need skilled and reliable workers and how you work together to ensure the available positions will be good fit for our veterans? Um, yes, yeah, so as far as finding companies, it's all been networking. Uh, I mentioned a few of our partners, uh, AAR and AMFA and AIM, uh, as well as ARSA. Um, I've worked with them in the past at a presentation at their conference. And so that's really how we've been getting introduced to employers. And when we meet with an employer, we go, what, what workers do you need? What classifications do you need? What are you looking for? And then we design a program to fit their needs. In this case, the aviation maintenance program is what we designed. It was we need maintainers, so let's create a program that can take somebody like myself, who's an infantryman, and turn me into a maintainer in the civilian world. Um, and that's what we've and that's what we've done. And I think when you look at how you you address that training, that that's really where everything needs to go. Is we we can't continue to look for um, can't get blood out of a turnip. You know, you got to keep expanding your pool and where you're going. Uh, to get to meet your needs, and that's what we're trying to do with the military. Okay. Uh, my my follow up is, um, what do employers? I mean, obviously they have to have um, you know be a part of this process. Need to do to make these positions as enticing as possible for transitioning service members, uh, and ensure that these jobs provide meaningful work and long term career for our veterans. Um, so that'd be my last follow up question. If you could answer that, please. Yes, sir. So the biggest thing that I've seen help veterans choose a career path is having a, an apprenticeship program, a, a DOL registered apprenticeship program where they can use their GI Bill to offset the cost of starting out as an apprentice at a lower wage. Most folks that we target, you know, E1 through E6, and not that we don't work with everybody, our first uh, electrician class had a major in it. Uh, when you're targeting E1 through E6, usually they're younger, they've got a, a young family, mortgage, car payments, credit cards, uh, all of the same bills that every other person is going to have. So when you have the opportunity to offset your costs of living with the GI Bill while you're on the job training, uh, that is huge. That would be probably the single biggest uh, piece of advice I would give an employer. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My time is up. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes now Mr. Carson for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, to uh, Dr. Webley and, and, and Ms. Gibbs, um, I, I, I really appreciate your, your testimony today. Um, I'm curious, what do you think uh, would be the most impactful way to increase the number of 
black and brown professionals in aviation? Um, is, 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 is this led by industry? Uh, or is there more action uh, from the FAA and DOT to better implement programs already in place? Uh, what new efforts should we even reconsider? What can our subcommittee do to advance diversity in aviation? Um, I, just to clarify, uh, Congressman, you said Dr. Webley. I am not a doctor, so I just, just wanted to verify you, you were addressing uh, me. That's all right. That's all right. People call me Dr. Dre, but that's okay. <laughs> Accepted, you know? No, no worries. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't for uh, Dr. Luddy uh, over there, the question. So, um, but since I am talking, I'll go ahead. Um, for so there's three pillars that we focus on, and I think sure. uh, uh, government, you know, whether it be the FAA or DOE, uh, any of the agencies that you know this stuff falls under their purview. Uh, three pillars that we focus on, and where there's always room to partner, is awareness. Number one, um, a lot of underrepresented people are underrepresented in these career fields because they mm -hmm. do not, they don't even know that they're an option. Um, hmm. So any resources that we can direct into schools to provide additional funding for awareness, um, for career exposure, career programs, uh, whether it's both, um, you know, VOTEC type programs in the high school level uh, that expose students to um, what uh, Mr. Kaiser was talking about, uh, opportunities that are out there uh, in the trades and whatnot, any of that is going to be helpful. Um, the second pillar is skill development. Once people become aware of these career opportunities um, at OBAP, we work hard to try and make sure that they build skills that are gonna make them competitive to actually be able to land these careers. Uh, we're not interested in lowering standards by any means. So all of our efforts go to making sure that whether it's our members or whether it's the students that we interact with, that we're developing programs that raise them up to competitive um, uh, levels um, in terms of their skills. So any kind of resources that can be directed to that, whether it's making education more affordable, whether it's leveraging the massive network of uh, community colleges that we have across the country that can provide uh, quality education at affordable rates. Um, any of those types of programs are very useful. And then the third one is access and advocacy. Uh, exactly what's happening right here uh, by giving organizations such as OVAP and um, the Viper Transitions and Latino Pilots Association Etc. a seat at the table so that we can share our ideas um, and have, have them be considered by folks that uh, like yourself that make decisions. Um, that's incredibly important. So those, uh, I pass it off to that's the next good. person. Thank um, you. Yeah. I, I concur with, with those observations. Um, access and opportunity are two of the greatest ways that we can um, increase brown, brown and black representation in aviation. We sponsor several programs for um, young students so that they can start early. If you see a black pilot, you realize you can become a black pilot. Mm -hmm. If you see brown technicians, you realize you can become a technician. So you have to have that access and exposure. Um, a seat at the table is incredibly important because being in the industry, we can offer suggestions for ways that government can um, come to the intersection of pro private public partnerships and how do we then expose young people to the industry, the industry that I love so much and I've been part of for so long. And so there are ways that we can um, become a little bit more intentional in the work that we're doing in order to increase representation um, for technical positions. And then how do we continue to push forward opportunities so that um, minorities and, and women and um, diversity increases in the boardroom as well. Um, everybody wants a seat at the table. And as we're, we're looking to, to have a seat, sometimes you have to bring your own folding chair and mm -hmm. plop it down at the end. And so we're really trying to make sure that we um, offer access and opportunities so that we can not only increase diversity with our executives, but also make sure that we have a diverse workforce in, and start to diversify pilots and technicians as well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. All right, thank you. The chair now recognizes the representative from Tennessee, Member Burchett, for five minutes. Aloha, Mr. Chairman. Thank Aloha. you, brother. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Ms. Gibbs, 
I appreciate your interest in addressing the aviation industry's. Oh, wait, first, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to um, submit for the record an article. Uh, key lawmaker quizzes airlines on delays and worker shortages. Without any objection, if I can. I do not object. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cohen. Um, uh, let's see, Mr. Webley. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Ms. Gibbs. I'm sorry, Ms. Gibbs. Well, I appreciate your interest in addressing um, the aviation industry's long-term workforce needs. What is JetBlue doing specifically right now to address the industry's current needs and get the workforce back to pre-pandemic levels? Uh, we're doing, we're hiring. I mean, that's one of the things that we're doing. We're doing a lot of hiring um, across the country to ensure that we um, have all of the proper people in place to service customers and welcome them back with a smile. Um, internally, we're doing several things to increase not only, um, you know, I mentioned our gateway program, which is helping to uh, create the next generation of pilots and, and create a diverse workforce there. Our gateway program for technicians, also creating the next group of aircraft mechanics and creating a diverse workforce there. We're looking internally to make sure that we have an opportunity to um, specifically promote and encourage our crew members who might have come here to work on the ramp or become a flight attendant to show them the vast opportunities that exist within aviation and to support them so that they can um, meet those challenges and exceed their and, and, and meet their goals. And so we're really working hard to um, hire across the country, like I said, including making sure that we are um, looking at all sorts of resources and opportunities to get more you know, bring diversity in, including having people on the, the, the recruiting team to specifically look for diverse talent. So those are some things that JetBlue is doing to um, increase the workforce here and welcome our the flying public back because we really want them to fly again. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Webley, uh, do you have any recommend recommendations for how we can bridge the skills gap and, com and combat the perception that well-paying professions are only available to people with four-year college degrees? Webley. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, by leveraging the, the very large network in the country of community colleges um, is, is probably one of the best ways that we can do that. And uh, for two reasons, really three reasons. Number one, uh, a significant amount of community colleges offer programs that um, develop skill sets that are directly translatable to the industry, um, including pilots. There are two-year uh, community college programs that, that essentially prepare you for a professional uh, career as a pilot. Um, so the, the second one is the affordability of community colleges. Um, you, can, you have the chance to take on two years of training, walk away with a skill, and then make a decision. Is that enough or do I want to continue on to a four-year program? You can do that and have options uh, with a two-year uh, two-year program, uh, and then the third one is that community colleges geographically are so spread out around the country. There's so many more of them. Students can go to those programs yet still remain within their own support networks, whether that be their parents, whether that be around family members that can help them with cost of living, uh, maintaining part-time jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so those are those are three things that I think can be done. Great, thank you. Mr. Kaiser, um, how can we better attract veterans to work within the aviation sector and are there any notable bar barriers to entry for veterans looking to join the civilian aviation workforce? And for the record, Mr. Chairman, um, my mama flew an airplane during the Second World War. She's a friend of then Senator Cohen in the state of legislature, now Representative Cohen, and um, she was exceptional and after the war, or the war was waning, um, she was encouraged to go elsewhere because of, they just didn't need women pilots, apparently. So if you could answer that question, those questions very quickly, I'd appreciate it. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I believe that the biggest barrier is that uh, we've been hit on a few times, uh, exposure. They don't know that the opportunity is available. Um, they don't know where to find it. They don't know how to get the training. Uh, they don't know who to apply to. I think companies need to do a better job of, of recruiting and letting them know that those opportunities are present. So that would be your biggest barrier is getting it in front of them and showing them the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. 
All right, Mahalo, Mr. Burchett. And uh, Chair, I'd like to now recognize uh, Member Brown for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And certainly uh, want to thank uh, Chair Larson for um, convening uh, this hearing uh, on uh, bridging the gap, improving diversity and inclusion in the U.S. aviation uh, workforce. Uh, Mr. Larson and I served together on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, and we know that there in the uh, military aviation context, uh, we have uh, not only a shortage of pilots and maintenance and navigators, uh, but certainly a lack of diversity in those military occupational specialties uh, as well. So I really do appreciate holding this hearing uh, today. Uh, it, it's critical that you know we continue to work together to develop a robust and diverse aviation workforce. Unfortunately, uh, the aviation workforce in the United States doesn't reflect the diversity of the nation as a whole. A lot of factors contribute to that. Uh, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 94% of all U.S. aircraft uh, pilots and flight engineers are white. We've heard this in our testimony today. Uh, these significant discrepancies suggest that increased outreach uh, to underrepresented groups could expand the hiring pool and help uh, meet future workforce needs in the aviation industry. Mr. Webley, a question for you in your uh, written testimony, you mentioned that uh, you said exposure to aerospace careers can help initiate an individual's desire to pursue a career in the aerospace industry. So what are the greatest obstacles for uh, the organization of black aerospace professionals uh, in exposing underrepresented communities uh, to the aerospace industry? And what are some of the best practices the airline industry still needs to adopt uh, so that they, that they haven't yet adopted in order for us to increase diversity uh, in the uh, workforce? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh I would say actually the, the biggest barrier to the exposure piece is the mobilization of people to actually connect with the students. Um, we've gone to great lengths, for example, at OBAP to develop a system that allows uh, educators to come to us, request a, uh, request a speaker that can come to their school, match that speaker or match that request with our pool of speakers, check their availability, um, and, and do the logistics of actually finding a person to go to that school. Um, that process seems like it would be simple, but you know there are thousands and thousands of schools across the country that frankly um, don't, uh, maybe they're not aware of organizations like OBAP or, or other nonprofits that are out there. Um, so uh, in short, as I said, it's, it's really the logistics of connecting the educator to real, making sure the educator number one knows that there's organizations out there that are willing to do this and then going through the logistics of connecting people um, uh, to, to be able to actually fulfill those needs of educators that want to have professionals in their schools. Um, so um, any kind of back-end systems that might be able to help out with um, meeting that requirement, whether it be uh, an FAA website where educators can go and register uh, and make requests and then send those requests out to different nonprofits that are operating in those areas. Anything like that might be, uh, might be a way to approach it. Well, thank you. Certainly look forward to continuing to work with you and your organization to see what we might be able to do in Congress uh, to encourage and support that. Um, on the Armed Services Committee, um, and I, ref I referenced the Armed Services Committee because as you all know on the panel, one in every three uh, pilots in commercial aviation uh, has military experience. It used to be 80% back in the 1960s. And while I'm always careful because I don't want to lose too many military pilots uh, to the commercial uh, industry, I also know that many of your pilots uh, fly in the, in the Air Force and Naval Reserves or in the Air National Guard. So there's a real sort of synergy there between uh, developing more diversity in military uh, aviation and how that can benefit uh, the work. And one of the things that we're working on in the House Armed Services Committee is a closer relationship between the Air Force, particularly, uh, and historically Black colleges uh, and universities. Um, we've also asked, the, directed the Secretary of Defense to look at barriers and obstacles 
uh, for uh, minorities and women uh, to entry uh, into uh, aviation positions. And I hope that when that study becomes available, it may inform what you do as well. Uh, but let me just wrap up by saying thank you to each and every one of you for your commitment to diversifying um, our workforce. Uh, look forward to working with you uh, so that we're doing on Capitol Hill everything that we need to do so that industry uh, can really lead the way on achieving greater diversity uh, in uh, the aviation industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Mahalo, Mr. Brown. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Payne for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Webley, uh, I'm pleased to see the push uh, to recruit pilot candidates that are diverse um, from underserved communities. However, there are uh, more employment opportunities in the aviation sector than um, being a pilot. Um, there are executives, engineers, air traffic controllers, co workers. The push for diversity must include uh these and other opportunities how do we increase diversity for these employment opportunities and what can congress do to assist thank you congressman for that uh for that question and um i guess i i would i would just start it by um We can't hear you. Hold on. I'm sorry. Are you, are you not hearing me anymore? Yeah, now we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I apologize. Uh, so I'll be quick. I was just going to say, to your point, OBAP started out as the Organization of Black Airline Pilots. Ten years ago, we changed our name to the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals to address exactly what you're talking about. Probably for every pilot job, there are probably 100 other jobs in the aerospace uh, professions uh, that are available. So. Um, we are definitely focused at OBAP um, on trying to expand the opportunities that are out there. I think um, some of the ways that we could uh, approach this from a, from a congressional standpoint is to expand um, opportunities such as the workforce development grants that were announced uh, earlier this year. Um, the, on the pilot side, there was the pilot and unmanned aerial systems operator um, grant, and then there was one for mechanics, but that doesn't address all of the other careers, uh, career professions that are out there. So I'd say um, more diversity within those grant programs, additional funding for those grant programs, so that organizations such as, uh, such as our organization can continue to do um, programming for particularly for youth that are not focused on pilot careers, uh, such as space engineering, maintenance technology, uh, et cetera. Excellent. And um, um, yeah, I look forward to speaking to you in the future um, uh, also about the unmanned um, unmanned aerial um, space sector. I uh, work with a um, African-American um, consortium of drone um, operators. So I want to make sure they're connected to you as well. But thank you for um, for your quest for your answer. Um, Captain Zapata Cardone, uh, encouraging young students to pursue a career in aviation is one of the best ways to bring a new generation into the field. Like you, I believe that increasing educational financial aid will allow more students, especially those from underserved communities, to pursue a career in aviation. If we do not increase financial aid, what will be the consequence? Thank you for that question, uh, Representative Payne. Um, the consequences is we're not going, it, it's, it's very simple, as everyone has mentioned, we're not going to get that diversity, equity, and inclusion within the airline industry and the aerospace industry if we do not increase uh, the financial aid. That is unfortunate. Um, we can only do so much. All of our organizations can only do so much. Um, as uh, uh, Mr. Webley described, we get requests all the time to uh, go and speak to schools, but we are very limited. There's not that many Latino pilots um, that can go to these schools. Exposure is huge. The other thing is gatekeepers. A lot of guidance counselors out there do not realize that there are so many careers that are in the aviation industry that are available to their students. Um, 
I can just quickly say that when I talked about wanting to be a pilot or a flight attendant, even when I was a teenager, I was laughed at. Granted, you can't see this because I'm five feet tall and I'm sitting down and I wear glasses. So the military was not an option for me either to become a pilot. But even when I start, when I finally became aware that I, bec I could become a civilian pilot, the financial cost almost made me walk away. I'm lucky that I had parents that were able to support me and able to co-sign loans for me, lend me money, and my own hard work of saving up money for all of the certificates and ratings. But it was overwhelming. And there were several times I almost left aviation because of the overwhelming financial barrier that is there. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Dr. Luji, uh, if aviation industry does not voluntarily provide data for metrics such as race and necessity, or occupation level, do you think that Congress should require it? Yes, I do. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, again, you know, how do we know where we're moving the numbers if we don't know where we're at? Um, some of the uh, racial ethnicity data that we, we all talked about this morning all came from the BLS, which is a fine source, but it could easily come from a more um, defined source, if you will, by adding it to the FAA Airman Certification data. So yes, the answer is Thank that's an important um, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you for the short answer. Hello, Mr. Payne. The chair now recognizes Mr. Titus for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I just heard um, uh, Captain Zapata Cardone mentioned about being short and wearing glasses. Uh, but I appreciate that. But I wanted to continue that kind of discussion. Uh, we've seen where outdated regulations really discriminate against uh, women of minorities often. Sometimes it's height, sometimes it's weight, sometimes it's hairdo or style. I wonder if you could comment about how those regulations may have changed over time or what we can do to push the industry in that direction so people aren't discriminated against for artificial kinds of reasons or cultural biases. And I'm assuming that question was for me. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Titus. Uh, yes, obviously regulations do, uh, are there for certain reasons. Uh, obviously in the military, uh, military jets are built for a certain stature. I didn't meet that requirement and I don't hold the military in any kind of uh, contempt or upset about that because that is just the way it is. Uh, certain regulations do need to be enforced for safety. Um, and obviously back then you need a 2020 vision. I believe the military has relaxed uh, their requirements for vision uh, since then. But um, as far as the other, uh, like you said, uh, stature or hairdos, uh, obviously that is the work of every company's DEI to understand that um, all hair is professional. Um, and, and it, and it, what, what, what I mean by this, and I cannot speak because I, I am not a black woman, and I, I want to give this to um, Ms. Gibbs, but oftentimes women that are, um, are African-American, they are the ones that often suffer from this bias of hair, not being professional. I'm very lucky. My, I, I've never suffered from that. Um, but as far as uh, regulations, obviously, uh, I was able to become a flight attendant for another airline. They had uh, done away with their uh, stature requirements, and it was actually at that airline that I started meeting female pilots. So I'm forever grateful for that, uh, for that job that I started meeting female pilots, and they mentored me and put me on this path to becoming a pilot. Um, but obviously, the work needs to be done at the companies for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and recognizing that everyone looks a little differently, our hair is, our hair is all uh, going to look different. That does not make us unprofessional. Ms. Gibbs, you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, I'm proud to say that we recently just um, revamped our entire uniform policy to make it more inclusive, to um, remove bias to um, acknowledge the differences in our skin and our hair and, and celebrate those things. So we really worked to ensure that there is no longer um, a bias around all of the 
the um, uniform policy. The other thing that I think is, is important is we have to realize that culturally, as we bring more people into the fold, that there is going to be change and transition. And how do you ensure that there isn't bias? That's making it part of policy. If you don't change policy and you leave it to interpretation, then you often lead yourself open for bias to come in and for people to be penalized for the way their hair looks or the way um, they might be wearing um, their garb that is native to their, their culture or their religion. And so we really wanted to um, remove those bi biases and allow our crew members to have the opportunity to express themselves and to really redefine what professionalism looks like. Thank you, that's great. I, I recall a time when flight attendants all had to look like Barbie dolls and even, even Mattel has expanded what Barbie looks like. So glad the airlines are doing the same thing. Just briefly, we heard about uh, increasing opportunities for STEM uh, fields for students and minority students. I've been working on something as a way to fund that is using the H-1B visas, <coughs> the visa that's there. These are for foreign workers and high tech sectors. If we could use a little more of that funding and designate it for um, a minority serving or historical black colleges, and so that it would go specifically for teaching uh, STEM to those students. I think that's a way to help um, build that population as well as the things like reducing student loan and uh, Pell Grants. I mean, would you generally agree that might be a good idea? Anybody? We absolutely agree. Um, that's definitely a way to, to introduce them into um, for, for, to support colleges, but we have to start younger. We have to get the kids when they're younger so that they That's grow true. up loving aviation. So how do you take some of that funding and make STEM programs that are geared towards ed education that are really targeting younger students? That's true. We found that if you don't start by junior high, you've lost them. So maybe we need not just uh, higher education, but public K through 12. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Okay, Mahalo, and then the chair now recognize Member Lynch for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Titus just stole my, my question or, or, or comment. So I'm, I'm former president of the Iron Workers Union in Boston, and uh, you know we, we adopted a program with women in construction to try to get women and racial minorities into the unions. Uh, we thought it uh, made us a stronger union uh, when when our membership reflected the entire city of Boston. And uh, thankfully they've made leaps and bounds and now we have women in leadership positions in that union over the past 30 years. So they've done a very good job of that. But, but what Ms. Titus and Ms. Gibbs have talked about, uh, I also founded a charter school based on STEM. It's one of the most diverse uh, charter schools uh, in the city of Boston, uh, but we really, really have to get in there early. Uh, our charter school is fifth grade through 12th grade, but uh, you know, I struggle because when, when we put out, we, we had three uh, English positions that were open and we had about 140 applicants, but we had three math and science positions open and we got 11, 11 applications because industry is just stealing that talent. And I'm just wondering, is there a way, uh, can, can we establish like academic chairs that would, would pay a stipend or, or a bonus to math and science and STEM uh, instructors and teachers to keep them in the schools at those young ages so we can actually prepare these young men and women, uh, to, you know, to, to, to get into uh, STEM-focused uh, professions and, and really to open up the widest opportunity for them as they are educated. I'm just wondering, uh, I'm trying everything, you know, uh, to try to get resources to put those teachers in those schools to prepare these young people. And I'm, uh, I'm struggling. I've had limited success. And I, I wonder if Ms. Gibbs, uh, you seem to be all over this issue if you might have some thoughts on that. <clears throat> I definitely think that um, offering stipends for our educators um, to stay in the school is important. 
Uh, but there are also so many programs to get college students who are coming right out of, who are, who are about to graduate. How do you get them into schools? And so there are um, several programs that nonprofit organizations that work specifically with that target audience that you're talking about. And so capturing those students while they're, they're right out of school, energetic and have a lot of, of ideas and bringing them into charter schools and helping them see, um, helping them get planted in their field. You might not keep them forever, but you'll have them when they, they first graduate. So I think that's really one of the ways to continue to look at um, bringing STEM education into, um, bringing it to life for, for younger students. And you can't just do chalk and talk. You have to really show all of the opportunities within STEM and all of the opportunities for science, technology, engineering, and math. And the, one of the ways to do that is to bring in careers and let people see the things that they can do um, if, if they pursue some of these, um, these avenues. So uh, good luck, but I think definitely going after some college students and looking at the nonprofit programs that exist for that reason would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zapata, as a, as a union sister, and I, and I appreciate that, you're, 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 you're right up front on that. Uh, do you think that the unions have a role to play here? Uh, is there something that Alpha could do or the machinist union that, uh, to, to diversify uh, the workforce? Absolutely. Um, Alpha has created the President's Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, which I'm a part of. And we are working with all of the organizations, Latino Pilots Association, OBAP, Sisters of the Sky, Women in Aviation, um, in order to collaborate, to reach out to these communities and show all of these young people. And it's been said over and over again, we have to get them at the grade school level to get them inspired to join the aviation and aerospace industry. But we are working together in order to diversify what our flight decks look like to better represent what the United States actually looks like. Well, that's great. Uh, my time has basically expired. So I want to thank you, all, all the witnesses for your uh, willingness to help the committee with its work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mahalo, Mr. Lynch, and the chair like now re recognize um, Representative Johnson from Georgia. Representative Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing. And um, thank you to the witnesses for your time and for your testimony. Since the Wright brothers first took to the skies at the turn of the 20th century, the dual goals of human aerospace travel and equality in America have rested on the horizon the same as they do with uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, other billionaires uh, venturing into space. Uh, this issue of equality and equity still loom large like the uh, earth uh, in front of uh, a spaceship uh, and those in it. Um, the dual goals of aerospace travel and equality in America have rested on the horizon. More than a century later, one dream has been achieved while the other woefully lags. Americans of color and women are severely underrepresented among pilots and flight engineers, and they're absent from leadership positions across the aviation industry. Racial injustice must be rooted out of every enterprise of American life. Ms. Gibbs, Corporate responsibility is not just an industry buzzword. It is essential to a more just, fair, and prosperous country. America's companies, large and small, must lead by example and, by, and be a part of the problem, excuse me, be a part of the solution. Unconscious bias in the training and hiring processes has long stymied diversity in the workplace. However, you state that JetBlue has revamped its hiring process to reduce unconscious bias. What specific changes have been made to the hiring process and how do those changes advance the goal of mitigating unintended discrimination? Thank you for your question. So we have two initiatives that we've put forth recently. One is Blue Select, 
and that's a required training program for how we interview designated to reduce bias in the interview process. And so we reduce inherent bias by having a structured interview process where we define the competencies that we want to evaluate to advance the interview. So if you meet competencies that are not, we, we, we can't interject um, personal opinion. And so we really want to make sure that everyone is being interviewed using the blue select process. That makes sure that we are putting forth um, a, everybody on an equal playing field and advancing them based on competencies, so, solely based on competencies. The other thing that we're doing is um, to increase diversity and leadership is the diverse slate initiative. And so historically for officers and above um, or directors and above, about 50% of the can candidates have been from underrepresented minority groups. Um, and so how do you continually make sure that that number is higher? And then how do you advance those people? And so if you present more opportunities, more diversity, we believe that will give us an opportunity to select the best candidate from a diverse pool of, of people. And using All right, the thank you. process that helps with mitigating bias. Okay, thank you for that answer. Mr. Kaiser, airline companies are generally successful at integrating former military pilots into their ranks. What efforts then are underway to integrate military personnel who worked in support roles, such as mechanics and crew members, into civilian aviation? And um, can you tell us about what uh, your company is doing in that regard to ensure uh, equity for underrepresented uh, persons? Yes, sir. So I believe in, in, I'm not qualified to speak on behalf of the industry and the companies and what their individual programs are. Um, I can speak to <clears throat> our program and, and what we're doing and who we're targeting. Uh, we go after everybody in the military. It's, it's no secret that uh, you get a, a huge diverse group that joins the military. And we all join it as a, uh, looking at it as a step up uh, in society, right? You, when, you, when you come from a home where you've seen people struggle, you, you look at the military as that window of hope that it's going to give me an opportunity to advance myself and my family and have a better life. And I think what we need to focus on is, is actually, um, you know, I've heard we're measuring and, and, and following through, but it's the following through that needs to happen. We need to actually ensure that it is a stepping up uh, into that next career, regardless of what that next career is and where that person came from. Thank you. My time has expired and I yield back. Well, Mr. Johnson, uh, the chair would like to now recognize Mr. Cohen, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the chairman of the full committee and the chairman of the subcommittee for having this hearing, which is so important. It's amazing the lack of diversity that we see in the aeronautics industry and personnel and that we need to do what we can to improve that. Uh, the uh, witnesses have talked about the fact that there are less than 5% of airline pilots are women, 3.4% are African-American, 5.4% of aircraft technicians are women, and only 10.8% of aircraft technicians are African-American. Less than one half of 1% of total professional pilots are black women. This is a staggering discrepancy and they need to be rectified. Uh, Mr. Webley, you are the chair of the board of directors of the organization of black aerospace professionals. Um, as a distribution hub of America, my district, Memphis, Tennessee, claims an extensive network of transportation infrastructure that contributes heavily to our nation's aviation industry. We're home to the Memphis International Airport, which houses the FedEx Super Hub, and our local economy depends on a strong aviation system, and we've got a majority African-American population in our city. 64% of that population is African-American. It's important our aviation professionals are representative of our community. In Olive Branch, your organization, Olive Branch, Mississippi, uh, your organization opened the Lieutenant Colonel Luke Weathers Jr. Flight Academy with the goal to train more than 225 Memphis area high school students to become certified flight instructors or secure private and instrument ratings by the year 2025. This is special to me because Lieutenant Colonel Weathers, who was a member of the famous Tuskegee Airmen who flew 112 combat missions, uh, was the first Af and during World War II was the first African American air traffic controller for the Federal Aviation Administration at the Memphis 
airport. He is honored with a plaque at the airport. Uh, I was honored to attend his funeral in Memphis and to attend his burial in Arlington Cemetery, where he was buried with full honors. A true American hero and a great aviation uh, pioneer. Can you speak to the importance of this flight academy named in Lieutenant Weathers' honor in, the re in Memphis and how it has helped facilitate the aviation opportunities to students in Memphis area schools and other individuals in the Mid-South region? Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I really appreciate getting this question. Um, the Luke Weathers Flight Academy, which you mentioned, um, is absolutely one of the things that we're most proud of uh, at OBAP. Um, it's one of the very few uh, truly nonprofit uh, organizations that's not a university um, that is focused 100% on producing more pilots from underrepresented communities, uh, specifically, like you said, uh, the greater Memphis area. Um, one of the things I think that makes Luke Weathers the most uh, unique in the area is, again, we are not focused on generating revenue through that program. Uh, we, we measure our success by the impact and outcomes that come from it. Um, our students are, we consider our students to be members. They, they are part of our family. Um, so the, one, the moment that they walk out of the door, out of the flight school, we still continue to care and be concerned about their well-being, whether it's their physical, emotional, uh, spiritual well-being, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the, the, the most important things about what Luke Weathers is doing um, with our partnerships through FedEx um, and uh, the, the Greater Memphis uh, School District, Shelby County School District. Uh, we've been able to uh, train and educate dozens of new pilots. Uh, specifically right now, we have 23 young black women uh, in training right now at Luke Weathers, which I don't think that number is matched anywhere else in the country in terms of uh, of effort to get that, that number. You talked about one half of 1% to increase that number. Um, so uh, yeah, we're very proud of it. Thank you for your work and your organization's work and, and honoring Ms. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Weathers. Uh, Federal Express has got an outstanding record on diversity efforts and they've been recognized for, for that over the years, both in pilot recruiting, diversity inclusion, uh, aircraft mechanic recruiting and other areas. So I'm pleased that you're working with them at all. Let me ask the ladies on the panel, Captain Zapata Cardone and, and Ms. Lutt, is there any reason that women are institutionally uh, neglected in the pipeline of airline personnel, that they're less involved in the military, less likely to be selected as military pilots that oftentimes filter into commercial aviation or other areas where they are, uh, have a, a, a larger hurdle to, to overcome to get into the industry? Um, thank you for that question. Um, the time is up, so I, I would like to ask if you would like for uh, Dr. Ludi and I to submit a written response to that question. T time's up, but it's always, never time is up for two outstanding witnesses to respond to a question. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, obviously, uh, yes, there's, there's uh, as doc, and I, I always refer to Dr. L uh, Dr. Ludi's uh, research that um, th there's a lot of biases, there's a lot of unconscious biases, outright uh, discrimination against women um, being, and, and I mean, this isn't just in the military, and I have never been in the military, so I can't speak as a military pilot, but just in my own experiences, um, being dismissed, um, being um, told that one of the funniest ones was I was told that I was not strong enough to be a pilot, um, that the aircraft would overpower me and I would never be able to recover from a deep stall, which is absolutely ludicrous. Um, there are biases because I'm, I'm a Latina. People knew that I was, uh, a, uh, my parents were Colombian. Uh, many people jokingly, but it still hurt, asked if I was uh, becoming a pilot so I could do drug runs from Colombia back to the United States. Um, and, and these are all microaggressions that add up. And, um, and that's speaking from my experience, uh, listening to other women speak about their experiences. They've experienced uh, different uh, discrimination uh, factors, but we all have the same story that we all persevered. Uh, we try not to listen to these um, uh, biases and continue on. And then I'll pass this off to Dr. Ludi. 
Well, thank you, Captain Zapata Cardone. You, you perfectly uh, described the experiences that many, many, many women in aviation have, having read hundreds, if not thousands, of survey responses on this topic. So, um, so you're exactly right. So, to answer the question, yes, it's you know there's significant barriers, but this particular barrier, um, again, is one of the greatest. And if we don't address this issue, we don't move the needle. Um, and that starts from the top with visible, loud uh, commitment from leadership and quite frankly, setting an environment of respect for all and zero tolerance for anything else, not just in words, but in actions. I want to thank the witnesses, thank the chairman for his indulgence in allowing me the uh, uh, extraordinary time. I yield back the balance of my time. No problem, Mr. Cohen. The chair uh, now recognizes uh, Member Holmes Norton for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is for uh, uh, Dr. Lutt first. Um, excuse me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can uh, hear you. Can you repeat your question and who is, it was directed towards? Do, uh, Dr. Rebecca, Re Rebecca Lutt. Uh, Dr. Lutt, uh, your testimony uh, outlined the challenges that women have faced in balancing work uh, and family. I'd be interested in any concrete family-friendly policies uh, that you think the aviation industry should adopt to retain and to ensure the steady the, the steadiness of the career advancement of their female workforce thank you for that question representative norton we know um, we talked about culture and bias and and those factors but um, as an example in one survey of women in aviation 38 percent of the women said they had thought about leaving the industry so if we can't hold on to who we have, we're not gonna increase the numbers. And in a follow-up question asking why, the number one reason most often given was the challenge of work family balance, followed by that workplace culture that we were just talking about with Captain Zapata Cardone. So we know it's an issue and we know it needs to be addressed. So how do we address it? We look at things like paid family leave, maternity and paternity leave, flexible schedules uh, and recognizing um, you know, unique ways. We've certainly learned a lot in the last year on scheduling uh, and flexibility, but we've also seen what's referred to as the she session uh, in our industry with disproportionately losing um, women in the workforce because they are, um, they take up more of the burden of work at home and childcare and caregiving. Um, so we need to recognize that as well. So I think it's important. I appreciate the question that we look at family policies like paid family leave and flexible scheduling to address some of these issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question for um, Mr. Webley, uh, because I'm interested that in your testimony, you described your organization's school outreach efforts. Uh, so I'd be interested in knowing how many school visits does your network typically conduct, let's say in a year, and how many do you think would be need needed to effectively build awareness about aviation career opportunities? Uh, thank you, Representative, for, for the question. Um, so I could give you uh, pre-COVID numbers because obviously with, uh, you know, things that happened with COVID, being physically in schools no longer became an option um, for many of our members. So uh, most recent data from 2019, again, that's pre-COVID number. Um, by the end of February, we had reached 50,000 students um, and we were on track to reach 100,000 students uh, in a single year. Um, our program to date has reached well over 200,000 students uh, across the country, um, hundreds of schools. Um, I don't have my total, total number of schools in front of me, but uh, I believe it's somewhere in the range of 250 uh, schools, and that's just one organization. 100% uh, volunteer program. We receive no dollars to, to operate that, that program. That's purely our members. Uh, volunteering to go out and do the good work. Um, so it'd be very difficult for me to estimate how many more schools 
Um, but I can say that year over year, the program continues to grow. And um, the, what I would attribute that to is the more educators find out about it, the more they want us to participate in that program. So um, I would say the growth is probably limitless, um, especially if you start talking about um, outside of major city centers where it's easier to find volunteers. If we start going into smaller, mid-sized cities, rural communities, uh, things of that nature, uh, it probably is a limitless amount of, uh, of educators that want to participate. Thank you very much. I yield. All right. Do I have any more to testify? Just myself. Okay. Well, I'm going to yield myself five minutes in. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, the chair and the ranking member for having this committee hearing. I think it's something very, very important. And um, I also want to thank the um, organizations that inspire uh, future pilots and mechanics and uh, children across uh, the country to enter the aviation and aeronaut, uh, aeronautics sector. Organizations like AOPA and ALPA and OBAP and Women in Aviation and the thousands of pilots across the country who sit at career fairs and, and uh, um, you know, aviation trade shows and military air shows and so many uh, that volunteer to inspire the next generation of aviators. Also want to thank um, Captain Zapata Cardone for your testimony. I think it was spot on. And uh, as someone who is a native Hawaiian pilot, uh, you know, recognizing a Latina pilot that just decades ago um, was, was very few and far uh, to come by, you know, it's quite an accomplishment of what you've been able to do and thank you for sharing your story. I think what you highlighted in your testimony, specifically the financial challenges of um, uh, seeking a airline career or a highly skilled aviation profession career is something that we as a Congress can address. You talked about uh, the federal education aid programs such as the Pell Grants and programs that in many cases are tied to accreditation. You talked about the GI Bill and its expansion and we know that unless you have a private pilot's license, you cannot use your GI Bill for flight training programs. Uh, you talked about student loan cancellation and student loan forgiveness. I think these are all things we can do to incentivize um, aviation throughout the country. And so I want to thank you for your testimony, but direct the funding um, component of your testimony to uh, Dr. Lute at the University of Nebraska and their Omaha Aviation Institution, which is an accredited program. Do you have any suggestions on how um, either the public or the uh, private sector can increase the financial incentives or the financial opportunities for students, especially from uh, minority and underrepresented communities um, to pursue careers in aviation, to um, put them on pathways to get into American uh, cockpits across the country? Yeah, thank you for that question. In addition to the financial aid that's already been discussed, there's a couple of areas to talk about in terms of cost. Uh, one, of course, is scholarships, um, acknowledging that organizations like Women in Aviation International have given out over $14.5 million in scholarships in their existence. But the other, to your point, is industry buying in and uh, ponying up and putting some money on the table. And we're seeing some good examples of that. The United Aviate Academy, you know, if you get accepted to the academy, they pay for your private pilot license. Another one that I'm really excited about is AAR, um, which is a collaboration between um, a global aviation services provider and a maintenance provider, education, um, Department of Labor grant funding and labor unions to help um, provide at no charge training for um, sheet metal courses, for example. Um, and that program that they do is actually targeted at Chicago at the South Side and it's enti almost entirely targeted to underrepresented groups. So that is a collaboration between education and industry where you're targeting underrepresented groups, they're getting paid uh, skill, um, learn to earn, if you will, um, and they will take that skill set and be able to go right into AAR or into other aviation uh, industry and then beginning to stack that skill, continuing to work with education to continue to add to their credentials. So um, I think industry collaboration is a really important part of the puzzle for the cost issue. Are you seeing uh, students that attend the program at the University of Nebraska 
um, that in addition to their college tuition and all the fees associated with that, uh, have to cover the cost of their flight provider fees, which in um, cases can run from $40,000 a year up to $85,000 a year. Are you seeing uh, that they're having issues utilizing the Pell Grant or other federal um, financial aid programs that could be, I guess, um, opened up more to aviation career fields? Without a doubt, yes. So we know, for example, the Pell Grant program um, doesn't even cover the cost really of tuition these days. So um, it's what, 6,400 max, I think, for the year. Um, our in-state tuition um, runs about 19 with the housing, and that's not counting flight on top of that. So then you're going to add, say, $50,000 in flight training costs on top of your tuition, housing, fees, and everything else. It's not enough. We absolutely need to increase access to Pell Grants and financial aid funding uh, for students to be successful. Um, and that includes um, being able to target, you know, a wide variety of diversity of students. All right. Thank you for that answer. And it looks like our time is up. So, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the, all the witnesses for being here today and, uh, most importantly, uh, helping us identify some of the obstacles or impediments into working to help improve the diversity of our workforce. But as I mentioned in my opening statement, just making sure that we have a workforce that's there to meet the demands moving forward, as, uh, as the chairman has noted. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and yield back. All right, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much.